Chapter 7 The State, Sin and Justice As we saw earlier, the philosopher of education Harold O. Rugg said in 1955 that Uncle Sam should be, quote, busy converting himself into Uncle Saviour, end quote. This assertion of the salvationist character of the state was first strongly asserted by President Woodrow Wilson, and since the long years of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's has been basic to American foreign and domestic policies. It has also been the premise of other states, most of all the Marxist ones. The modern states has a moral foundation, but it is not a Christian one, rather it is emphatically humanistic. As Quigley noted of the English and American establishments, quote, their roots were to be found in ancient Athens rather than in modern Manchester, end quote. In other words, the roots of the humanistic order were not in economic reality, that is, in Manchester, nor in the free market. Neither were they in biblical faith. The statists saw themselves in terms of Plato's Republic. Their hostility was reserved for, quote, the darkness of theocratic law, end quote, that is, biblical law. They did borrow the pattern of their functioning somewhat vaguely from the Jesuits. In any event, the modern state sees itself in messianic terms and as man's saviour. State planning is the substitute for God's predestination. State welfare programmes have worked to displace Christian charity and the state sees itself as the new agency of providence, replacing God. In scripture, the state has a specific ministry, the ministry of justice, Romans 13.1. Its place in the plan of God is a real, if limited, one. The state must be the servant of the Messiah. The modern state has made itself the Messiah. In so doing, it has repudiated Christianity and the history of Christianity for ancient paganism. Rome saw itself as developing the ultimate order, inclusive of God, men, and the universe. According to Seneca in Ad Marcium 28.1, quote, you are about to enter a city shared by gods and men, a city that embraces the universe that is bound by fixed and eternal laws. End quote. This ideal cosmic order was to be the good of the state. Rome was the quote, great city end quote, in process of development, and it could therefore be called by Cicero, Philippics 4, 6, 14, quote, the light of the world, the guardian of all nations. End quote. Rome was to become the city of justice, quote, belonging to all humanity. End quote. Mazzolani states its role was thus salvation. Cicero, Philippics 5.18.49, said of Octavian, quote, In him we place our hopes of liberty, from him we have already received salvation. End quote. In fact, however, Rome became the triumph of the oppressive tax collector. A barbarian raid and a visit from the tax gatherer came to rank equally as disasters, until finally the taxman came to be the greater evil, and none found Rome worth defending. When the sack of Rome came in AD 410 at the hands of the Visigoths, no irreparable damage was done to the buildings. Rome waned from a great metropolis to a town because it was bankrupt. Christians often held that the fall of Rome was a moral necessity, and some said that the Lord would not return until the empire fell. Thus, Rome, which presented itself as the hope and the light of the world, in time became anathema to all men and deserted by all. The modern states pursuing the same messianic course faces the same fate. In the year AD 40, the Emperor Caligula ordered that his statue be set up in the temple at Jerusalem. The whole Jewish world reacted with horror. Before the order could be carried out, Caligula was assassinated. In AD 52-53, Paul wrote his letters to the Thessalonians. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3-10, Paul says, quote, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, 
so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time? For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. End quote. According to Caird, Paul's words have the Caligula episode in mind. Paul saw in Caligula's madness the insanity and evil of an ungodly state. The basic and original sin of man is to be a God, determining or knowing for oneself good and evil. Genesis 3.5 This basic sin, which is sin in its essence, manifests itself not only in man, but in man's institutions. During most of history, the state has been man's central institution, and therefore the central manifestation in corporate form of man's original sin. As a result, the state has repeatedly presented itself as man's saviour and God. Warfield, in commenting on this text, called attention to the fallacy of popular eschatological views. The great fact of all prophecy, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 3-10 is prophecy, is that it is ethical or moral in its purpose. Prophecy does not seek to satisfy our curiosity, but to strengthen us morally. The quote-unquote coming of the Lord to destroy the man of sin is not necessarily, nor in this case at all, his coming in person, the end time coming, but his coming in judgment, an end point coming. Neither the revelation nor the destruction of the man of sin are to be seen thus as an end time event. The man of sin is sometimes in the near future of the Thessalonians and Paul. Warfield considered the man of sin to be, quote, the line of emperors considered as the embodiment of persecuting power, end quote. The restraining power was the Jewish states whose existence gave some protection to the Christians in that Rome gave to them, as a, quote, Jewish sect, end quote, the same immunity from Roman controls which Jewish faith possessed. Finally, in this interpretation, the apostasy is obviously the great apostasy of the Jews, gradually filling up all these years and hastening to his completion in their destruction. Paul thus saw a close connection between the tempter and this primeval plan, original sin, and statism outside of Christ. The state in Christ is God's instrument for the accomplishment of justice. The state outside of Christ is Satan's instrument for the furthering of his plan to substitute the will of the creature for the creator. For this reason, it is impossible for us as Christians to be indifferent to the theology of the state.